What would I like to do? I would like to talk about a national German national innovation strategy and um, then uh, use a very specific example which we in Germany uh, framed Industry 4.0 and I will put that into a European context and into the context of European uh, research and innovation policies. So this offers you at least three ports of entry. One is um, innovation strategies from a national perspective. The second is the specific example of advanced and modern manufacturing. And the third is the European level. So um, let's start with, with the first. Um, in Germany, we have worked for quite some time on expanding our national research and innovation system. We are spending a whole lot of money. In 2005, German uh, R&D spending was 2.4% of the gross domestic product. In 2014, these are the latest figures, uh, numbers moved up to 2.9%. So we are close to the 3% objective. And we are in a group of European countries that spend quite some amount of money together with Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Austria, we seem to be the front runners on the European level on a worldwide scale. There is a small number of countries uh, that spend more money on research and innovation. Israel, as you all know, Korea, Japan. So we try to be among the group of innovation leaders. And if you look at the uh, European Innovation Union scoreboard, Germany uh, belongs to the group of front runners. Are we as good as the rankings indicate? If you look at other rankings on international level that take a much broader perspective on framework conditions, it seems that we could do better than the numbers indicate. So we are among the top five to top 15 uh, innovation-friendly countries on the globe. Let's take it that way. Uh, what did we do in order to um, be part of this group. In 2006, we started with a national innovation strategy which we framed the high-tech strategy. The strategy involves all stakeholders. It tries to be an initiative at the national level which brings different business sectors as well as the various government departments under one roof. We updated the strategy now we are in a third phase. Where did we start? The first one was driven, very much driven by a perspective on key enabling technologies. We identified about 15 key enabling technologies and tried to see what a potential they had for value creation. Um, in its second phase, we did not change policies totally, but we changed perspective from a technology push to a demand pull perspective. So we looked at what is the societal demand, what are the areas that require innovation. And so fields came up just like uh, climate and energy, uh, health and nutrition, mobility, uh, communication, or civil security. And if you look around the globe, you'll find those phrases and those keywords all over. Um, my, my most favorite example is back in the 1990s, I attended a meeting of the Max Planck Society, and uh, they brought together academic leaders from all over the world talking about their strategies for the future. And the outcome was they all focus on bio, nano, info, and optical technologies. That we did in, in the first phase of the high-tech strategy. In the second phase, we all, just like many other countries, looked at the grand challenges. What do we do right now? We merge the perspectives, so we look at key enabling technologies, <clears throat> we look at societal drivers, we look at global challenges which <clears throat> we can address and which we should address. And we look not only at innovation from a technological perspective, but also from a societal perspective. We try to uh, come to grips with what we call social innovation as well. Well, as I said in the very beginning, if I may make four points to sum that up, um, innovation policies require a great deal of money, and policies always compete with other policy areas. In Germany, in the past 10 years, even in times of budget consolidation, um, we set priorities 
uh, at research and innovation, and it seemed to pay off. It seemed to be one of the factors that helped Germany to come out of uh, the financial and economic crisis after 2008 fairly fast. And a second aspect is that we combined and reoriented our innovation strategy um, and addressed grand societal challenges. One of the challenges, of course, is the digital economy, and I will talk about that in a minute from now. Uh, a third angle and the third aspect of the further development of the national innovation strategy is that we try to be more systemic and try to be more inclusive. Uh, so in terms of planning research agendas, in terms of executing research agendas, we try to tie in various groups and actors of society. Uh, so downstairs I said uh, the Federal Ministry of Education and research differs from quite a number of other European research ministries in that we are not only a governmental actor with regard to rules, regulation, legis legislation, execution of legislation, we are at the same time a funding agency. We spend about 2.5 billion euro every year on direct funding for collaborative research of um, academic institutions and uh, businesses. And when we set out our research and funding agendas, we try to um, have <clears throat> discussion and focus groups uh, prior to um, finally formulating this agenda. And we try to bring in the perspective of non-governmental organizations and other actors of society in order to come up with a joint and common understanding of the objectives of science and research. So participation and transparency is a third aspect which is important for us. And then, of course, uh, we try to improve uh, communication and cooperation of the stakeholders in industry and in the business world, in science and within the government. One of the key examples of this strategy is what we call Industry 4.0. In other countries, it's called the Internet of Things, it's called advanced manufacturing, it's called modern or digital manufacturing. Um, and each term uh, has a slightly different perspective, but in general, they, address, they all address uh, a similar ch uh, challenge. If I may try to provide you with <clears throat> a definition, the term industry 4.0, from a German perspective, describes a modern mode of production that brings together cyber-physical or embedded systems and network-based communication. Driven by internet-based communication processes, production equipment communicates autonomously. Antique technological components of Industry 4.0 processes are sensor and actuator devices, hardware components, communication technology, data processing devices, and software. And in addition, there is the human factor. And I will talk about the human factor as well. And if we take all this together, we talk about smart factories indeed. Why do we phrase it Industry 4.0 in Germany? It's a historical perspective. We look at the first industrial revolution with the steam engine. We then look at mass production in the Ford Motor Company as a second phase of uh, industrial development. The third phase would be the entrance of computer technology into production processes. And the fourth step, Industry 4.0, is the introduction of network-based technologies into the production world. About seven years ago, as part of our national innovation strategic approach, and we have an advisory board for this, um, which we call the High Tech Forum, um, a group of production pioneers, academics, engineers, business representatives got together and said, we have to address this new challenge of network-based production. And they started to come up to design a research agenda which built upon uh, prior research uh, projects on, on embedded systems, cyber-physical systems, and um, they extended this to network technologies. And so they came up with a research agenda which we funded, and about four years later, we thought that um, 
the baby had grown and the child was able to walk on its own. And so we gave it away and there was a group of um, business associations uh, bringing together all um, uh, actors in the manufacturing uh, um, uh, industry. And they started to create their own, what they call platform, discussion group, strategic circle to further promote Industry 4.0. And over time, they developed what they call a common reference architecture for the further development of Industry 4.0. But it turned out, if I may be frank, it turned out that um, the association could not really combine the various company interests because this is a competitive field and we talk about competitive advantages by improving and modernizing modes of production. And so they, um, to some extent, met on not probably the lowest common denominator, but definitely they did not aim very, very high because it was so competitive. And so about three years ago, at the beginning of the current legislative period in Germany, um, we decided that we take a fresh look at this uh, group and at this process of self-organization within industry. And even companies were happy that we as a government take a f took a fresh approach to bring together uh, the various ministries within the German government together with company representatives rather than business association representatives. So we brought in company representatives, <laughs> amongst others, Siemens, uh, but also small and medium-sized companies to have a fair representation of different um, uh, enterprises, different branches, different sectors, and different uh, economic approaches to the topic. And we brought them together with um, experts from the academic field, from engineering, um, but also from um, vocational education and training, amongst others. And we brought the trade unions in, and as I said, the research organization. So what we have now is called the Industry 4.0 Platform, a network of experts to further promote um, this uh, development. And we established individual working groups that focus on, amongst others, research and innovation, they focus on another working group focuses on software architecture to have a common and joint architectural software architectural model that uh, to some extent and as far as possible provides a uniform standard for, uh, for the industry. We look at standardization on the national and international level. We look at data security. We look at legal aspects and we look at human resources and training. Legal aspects are extremely challenging. To whom belong the data? If you create data during the production process and you share data on a joint platform, is it the company that produces and creates the data during the production process? Is it the, the software company that provides the platform for the exchange of data? Is it the user of the data? And if one of the intermediators uh, goes bankrupt, what happens to the data which are stored someplace and no longer are within the company. So very complicated and challenging topics which are addressed by the various working groups. But to talk about Industry 4.0 is one thing, to see it happen is another. And so we established um, a window, um, um, an internet-based window. There is an interactive map on the internet which provides uh, 200 showcases of Industry 4.0 applications all over Germany. What are the challenges? One of the challenges is, of course, research and innovation. We have to continue to provide research funding. We spend about almost more than 300 million euro in the past, euros in the past to, for research projects. And we are currently funding, and we moved uh, away from fundamental and uh, research. We've moved away from research on individual cyber physical systems now to, as far as possible, and within European regulations, to research projects that try to apply the knowledge now on the company level. And we try to reach out to small and medium-sized enterprises 
Because in Germany, if you look at, look at the development, there is a small group of companies which are the front runners, which apply the latest technologies. And then there is a very large group of small and medium-sized and mid-cap companies in Germany, which are quite hesitant because they lack the expertise and they don't know what to make out of the development. And if you have to invest into production equipment, which you use for 10, 20, or 30 years, it's a major investment, and companies hesitate to make the investment right now. <clears throat> so together with our colleagues in the Ministry of the Economy, um, we established information hubs all over Germany to inform and to reach out to small and medium-sized enterprises. And we provide test beds places to try out modern technologies, both for those who develop Industry 4.0 equipment, so to the machine producers, and at the same time, um, companies that try to take advantage of it and try to um, uh, emulate and model their production processes based on these new technologies. So providing um, test environments seems to be one way in order to motivate company to move ahead. And I mentioned the human factor. Um, we also uh, established research programs together with employers and the unions on the future of the workplace. Because Industry 4.0, the digitization of production processes, uh, comes along with new requirements for those who work on the production lines and uh, new demands for on the one hand, <clears throat> digital knowledge, software applications, software development, and flexibility. Because if you have a network-based production process, one of the advantages is that production equipment adjusts to the different parts that come into the production process, and you can start to individualize mass production. But that means that those who work in the factories have to be more flexible and have to adjust to this flexible production process. So we look at qualification, we look at training of people. This was my Industry 4.0 example as one of the showpieces of what a national innovation strategy can do. Identify a topic, uh, address it from a research side, then hand it over to a collaboration of public funders and uh, business uh, appli appliers, uh, those who apply the knowledge uh, in the business world and then try to further promote an issue and bring it forward by providing incentives, as I said, building up test environments, new research projects on the social development that come with a new technology. We monitor this and we do have an expert group which we call the expert group on research and innovation. And they published their annual report just recently, and they criticized us. Why so? Because they said a focus on modern modes of industrial production is pretty much in line with the present state of the German economy. You, we came out of the economic crisis, amongst others, also because we had a strong industrial base. But the question and the challenge they gave us is, is this the future? Is it right to focus on the digitization and the network uh, um, and the application of network technologies in the production field only? And what are the new fields which we probably do not see? Application of digital technologies in, med in the medical world, so health and digitization, uh, or in a more abstract and general way, new services coming out of digital technologies do we in Germany uh, invest in companies that provide digital platforms for new services? So are we too much path dependent by looking at the digitization of manufacturing? Uh, and what else shall we do? It's an open question. We haven't found a real answer. We've set up within our uh, expert group, we have set up a group, uh, not as a result of this criticism, as a matter of fact, already a year ago, on um, life science, medical services, and digitization. And we have set up a working group which focuses on autonomous systems. 
ranging from robotics in production as well as service robotics to um, autonomous uh, driving and autonomous mobility. So we try to address new fields in order to be in line with further development. I'm afraid, however, other countries pretty much do the same. So um, the unique selling point still has to be identified. My last point, the European perspective. Um, if we look at research and innovation, this is a field on the European agenda which is taken for granted and you don't make headlines with research and innovation. And at the same time, we all pay lip service to <laughs> Europe has to become more competitive. We have to compete with the United States and the Americas on the one hand, when we have to compete with China and Asia on the other. And we can only do this if we work together and Europe is united and strong. That is the lip service we all pay. What is the reality? Um, Research and innovation policies have not really become the number one issue on the European agenda. Uh, Finance-wise, yes, we have done not bad. Uh, Horizon 2020 is the largest transnational research program ever on the globe, 75 billion euro committed to this. However, if money is needed during the uh, current financial framework period, and money has to be found someplace, very often it's Horizon 2020, where you can take it away for other purposes. So um, it seems to be at least ambivalent. So what can we do, and what is the um, current state? As I said, Horizon 2020 is well-funded, but uh, the individual performance uh, in science and innovation um, is probably not in line with the objectives which we have phrased on the European level. The 3% GDP goal, as I said in the very beginning, has only been uh, reached by a small number of countries, and um, we still try to find ways to make better use of the knowledge which we have in Europe for value creation in Europe. Um, Horizon 2020 has a well-balanced architecture now with blue skies research on the one hand and market application on the other. And we do have a wealth of instruments to promote science and research. When we set up and designed Horizon 2020, there was a huge um, outcry, make it simpler, make it better and simpler. And simplification was the issue. Now, being almost halfway through Horizon 2020, uh, it seems to me that we have lost some of the impetus. We try to make it a little bit simpler at the very beginning, and from then on, we differentiated and further developed, and uh, we have created, again, a toolkit which only the very experts can really understand and make use of. So this is not really conducive for those who try to get appropriate funding. The challenges are out there, of course. Aging societies in Europe, uh, neurodegenerative diseases as one of the big health challenges, uh, health and nutrition, uh, the digitalization of societies. Uh, Commissioner Moedas has answered with a strategy which he called the three O's, uh, open science, open innovation, and open to the world. Yes, uh, we have to be open to the world, but what do the other two open actually mean? Um, open seems to be a keyword uh, which uh, is now being used and applied in quite a number of countries. At the beginning of this week, I spoke to the Chinese research minister, Wang Gang, and he uh, spoke about or reported from the 13th National People's Congress, and he said, we have come up with a new innovation strategy, and there are a number of adjectives to describe them, to describe the strategy. One is green, one is open, and uh, then there was coordination, there was innovation, and there was sharing. So these are the buzzwords. So open seems to be a buzzword for the digital world, and um, prior to coming here, we sat downstairs together in a small group of people, and we talked about 
intellectual property rights and how do we find the right balance of um, research within academic institutions that can be applied to uh, business applications. And IPR, of course, is the legal tool uh, to provide an appropriate frame framework for the transition and use of ideas. A different development are indeed open innovation campuses. And one of the most shining examples I've seen in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where Philips, the company Philips, stopped operation on its own R&D campus. And they actually pulled out the, the Philips company sign. They gave it away. They opened the gates in a literal sense to new companies and uh, academic institutions, and they, they created an open innovation campus. Does an open innovation campus work without IPR rules? No. Um, the difference is that you talk about IPR rules in the very beginning, and you apply the same rules to all actors on campus, but then you at the same time agree on sharing some part of the knowledge which you develop by jointly using the research equipment which is available. And then you define the ways on how to proprietary, uh, in a proprietary sense, uh, take advantage of the knowledge even further. So open can be one of the answers. Another answer certainly has to be uh, to resume the road of simplification, make the instruments better understandable to others and pave the road from blue skies research to applied knowledge in a structured way. A new development is a new instrument which is called important project of common European interest. We do see that in a number of um, business sectors, amongst them microelectronics, and one of the major international chip producers is here in uh, Ireland. Um, in this field, we no longer need regulations to make sure that we have competition within Europe. We hardly have any companies left. So if we talk about competition, we talk about global competition. And this global competition is disturbed by um, uh, national funding policies in countries like Taiwan, Korea, and even the United States. So in order to provide a regulatory framework that helps companies within Europe to compete on an international level in order to have this, this uh, instrument of important project of common European interest was developed. And we curiously take a look at this in order to see whether it can help uh, the um, European microelectronics industry to survive in this global competition. If we look at European governance, we do see that the European Commission, at least in the field of research and innovation, plays an even stronger role, which is not clearly defined. If the Commission uh, does not reach its objectives by discussing it with the member states, they make a shortcut and talk to the research organizations directly. This is called stakeholder dialogue. Um, to some extent, we, from a national perspective, perceive this as circumvention of member state perspectives. Um, so in addition to simplifying the instruments, with, in addition to um, providing the right regulatory framework to compete globally, um, we see that the Commission should define its role clearly um, with regard to the member states. We need a clear definition of labor and we need a clear definition of what added European value means and at what level uh, commission activities are necessary and to what extent the member states can live up to the ambition they formulate themselves. That means, however, at the same time that the member states have to come up with a clear vision of what research and innovation means. And this, in a modern world, means that we have to look beyond research policies and have to take into account uh, education and training on the one hand, but at, on the other hand also um, industry and labor policies. And we do have to do this on a national level. We in Germany try to do it by bringing actors together under the umbrella of the high-tech strategy in Germany, but we also have 
to do this on the European level as well. So what does this mean? If we run up for the follow-up program of Horizon 2020, we should take all this into account. And we as member states have to be more ambitious in shaping a, an ambitious agenda of uh, the Research and Competitiveness Council. We have to look at intersectoral discussions and at interdepartmental discussions because the bottom line is <clears throat> we cannot do without Europe, of course. As Hans-Dietrich Genscher, the former foreign minister in Germany who died just recently, as he said, Europe is our future, we have no other. And let me add, research, science and innovation are the key to European future, so we have to work on these fields as well. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to discussions.